Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on Greek philosophy and Greek skepticism, specifically Sextus Empiricus, who is the main Greek skeptic through whom we understand Pyrrho, Anesthodemus, and the folks of the last talk. So please see the last talk and the last few about Greek philosophy, as well as my talks about Indian and Chinese skepticism, such as Jainism, Buddhism, and Taoism. I will also soon be uh, continuing my talks on Zen and do a couple on Linji and Kill the Buddha, which is extremely skeptical, <laughs> skeptical, skeptical in the extreme. So Sextus Empiricus, who lived from about 160 to 210, so notice he is after zero going forward, is the first Peronian skeptic whose text survives today. The major work by which Pyrrho, Anesthodemus, and Peronian skepticism are known. In philosophy, in fact in early modern European philosophy, including Descartes, Hume, and others, they know their Greek philosophy, they are doing a new thing and understand that they are part of modern European philosophy, but they do know Greek philosophy such that they know what skepticism is, which is like Taoism in China, Buddhism in India and China, etc. But they use the terms skeptic as well as per Peronian, Pyrrhonist, and Peronian skepticism interchangeably. So Descartes writes to a friend and says, I know how to defeat Peronianism. And then in another place he says, Peronian skepticism, because for Descartes, by I think therefore I am, he wants to come up with an absolute uh, pivotal fact, uh, rather Archimedean, such that it can be a, le a, a fulcrum for a lever on which can turn the rest of his philosophy. If he's certain of himself, a la God, and his thinking consciousness, then he can undo the skeptics because he has fact one can lead to fact two, fact three. And so Descartes thinks he is trying to specifically overcome Pyrrhonism and Pyrrhonian skepticism with the advent of modern uh, European philosophy. We're going to get to that with modern Europeans, but I am just saying here is that Sextus's work is known as uh, Pyrrho's work, which is the earlier first major Greek skeptic, Skeptikos, inquirer. And Sextus's work and Pyrrho's work is known as skepticism, which is actually where we very much get the word inquirer-e, skepticism but also Pyrrhonist and Pyrrhonianism and Pyrrhonian skepticism. You could say Sextenian, <laughs> I suppose, skepticism, but it is known as Pyrrhonian skepticism after Pyrrho. So Sextus's major work, which is where we get Pyrrhonian skepticism very much from, can be variously translated as Outlines of Skepticism or Outlines of Pyrrhonism. Both titles exist in print today as the same text. Sextus is heavily influenced by Anesthodemus, and he places the ten tropes centrally in the beginning of his outlines. If you remember those ten tropes, in fact, it is worth going over those ten tropes again. Let me call that up right here. Is you have, that is Pyrrho, and actually it is more, uh, let's go to the skepticism entry as a whole, which has all the material here together. The ten tropes, which we had at the end, but we will have at the beginning here, and I mentioned with skepticism, we are going to get into reducing these to the two modes of the circle and the line. You have the ten tropes, which I mentioned last time, which are various animals, uh, see things and look at things differently, various people, uh, people, an individual, can look at things differently at different times and places. Perception varies from time and then place to uh, back and forth. That's the first five. Things are perceived through media, not, again, modern media, but air and water. And, uh, yes, such that in space no one can hear you or Ripley scream. The things we perceive change const uh, continuously in size, color, and temperature. Perceptions are relative and interact with each other. Perceptions become weaker after repetition, becoming custom, and people are raised in various cultures under various laws and customs. Now, you'll actually notice as I go over those, and I didn't try to reduce them entirely last time because there's plenty of time to do that this time, you actually have something about media here. And again, modern folks are thinking, wow, media, media is lying to me. Well, air and water aren't exactly lying to you. And I'm talking to you through media, as in through the air to the mic, which is right here. Um, and then that goes through the airwaves, goes through the beep, 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 and possibly through your Wi-Fi to you. And then you have your emotions and your culture and you get my words through that to you. Otherwise, I'm speaking, uh, I'm speaking ancient Greek and you can't understand anything 
uh, which Plato talks about in the Theotetus, I believe, is that, well, if you look at a foreigner language and you can't, you see the form, you don't get the meaning none, do you none? So you are, media is culture, eyes, air, water, everything, which is how I'm able to say words to you and you can watch my face move around or anything behind me. Uh, which could be moving around along with the cats. One of them perched over there on the window in the sunlight, uh, almost outside the cave. Again, I don't let the cats fully out of the cave. Again, we tell them the noble lie. They don't understand English, though. It's one of them foreigner tongues. So effectively, we have those ten modes, and without getting, uh, without presenting them as an airtight system, what you find is it repeats over and over again. People look at things from the angles, position, time, and media, what is between them and other things, that they look at things, uh, that they look through, in order to have subjectivity and experience. One of the great ways of understanding this with Wittgenstein, and I love this kind of thinking a lot in many thinkers, is think about meaning and your eyes and your mind as in circuits of activity. When people say things are socially constructed, they don't mean they're built up as a conspiracy. They mean that you and I walk around and we look at things and we talk about things, and that builds everything up together through our human activity, eyes, mind, and thus we are viewing everything through media. And in that sense, it merely means you'd have to hear somebody tell somebody about what happened and Sally burned down the barn, you know, uh, with the Great Chicago Fire. Um, and yes, all of that, Sally the Cow, and uh, kicked over the lantern. You'd have to hear that story through media, so media isn't evil, it's just part of the human subjective condition and we should be aware of it. The skeptic is not saying let's learn things purely from the source, which is a bit more platonic, uh, perhaps later academy mysticism. Uh, is that you're supposed to learn about things, you're supposed to debate and figure things out, you just have to pay attention to how you see things th via media, not just text, but air, water, light, and the fire in your mind and the culture in which you are raised. That obviously gets us even all the way to postmodernism and modern thought, because that's a whole lot of what postmodernism would tell you in French, another foreigner tongue, yes, some kind of moon man language. So... S Sextus writes what is the famous outlines of skepticism, which could also be translated outlines of Pyrrhonism if those titles are interchangeable. You do find that as various translations of the titles for just that reason. Sextus is heavily influenced by Anesthodemus. As said, the ten tropes are up front. Several other works of Sextus's survive, gathered under the title, and this is, I mentioned last time, Sextus is against everybody. <laughs> sort of like in The Simpsons, where one of the bullies is like, I don't believe in anything anymore. I'm going to law school. And Homer's like, no! It's like, this guy doesn't believe in anything any anymore. He's against the professors, against the mathematicians, against the astronomers, against the rhetoricians, against the musicians, against the ethicists, against the logicians, against the physicists, against the, phys uh, against the physicians, and most centrally, against the dogmatists. So this guy's got a bone to pick with the physicists as well as everybody else, you know? Uh, algebra is apparently something like the settling of a variable or the settling of a bone. Um, and medically, it is known uh, algebra settling and uh, weighing X and Y to weigh them out and uh, settle things on both sides, like one settles a bone with a splint. So Sextus was likely a doctor, possibly. People say the same about Heraclitus because they both talk a lot about uh, the human condition and mind and body. Does that mean they're doctors? Who knows? Sextus lived in Alexandria, Egypt, though this is disputable, as some sources place him in Athens and others in Rome. Various sources, including the famous Dr. Galen, report that Pyrrhonian skepticism was popular among many in the medical profession, as it was always possible to be wrong about a diagnosis and change treatment depending on outcomes, such that practical judgment is an imperfect process of interpretation. This remains so today, in spite of the fact that medicine is perhaps the most important and practical of the sciences for our survival. Think about how I have friends in computers, uh, not, you know, we have to go let them out, you know, like, uh, are they, is your refrigerator running? You know, Prince Albert in a can, is uh, that I have friends in computers, and not only is the only safe network one that's turned off, you know, the only unhackable network is one that is unplugged, 
But you also have here uh, computers and medicine are very practical things everybody has to use. They're also fantastically complicated, such that no individual understands all of medicine and no individual understands all of computers. Yet we crank them out in factories because we have enough people working together. Think about that and having the uber view and the higher mind. We don't all, it, it would be very difficult for us to invent computers from scratch wand wandering out of the jungle because even with the people we are and the knowledge we have, actually none of us all together know entirely are experts on every part of a computer. But that doesn't matter given human coordination and activity. Think about interweaving beyond our minds and intents with that. So what you have is that doctors today, if they give you medication, what do they tell you? Well, if you have a terrible reaction to this because of everything else in your life or your personal individuality, you just have to come back and we re-diagnose you. Now, you don't find doctors necessarily being skeptical as opposed to dogmatic, in the same way I don't think you'd find doctors being conservative as opposed to progressive necessarily or anything like that, no matter my or your opinions on any of that or feelings. But at the same time, medicine, like engineering, would be a practical science where instead of absolute certainties, the joke, uh, they say physicists, the joke is like, uh, you go to the physicist, design me a pen for my cow, and the physicist says, okay, let's an imagine, imagine an ideal spherical cow. It's like, well, there are no ideal spherical cows because in medicine if you as a non as a non spherical non ideal non ideal cow go to the doctor and like hey as a cow can you help me out uh, fellow cow the doctor says well i am outstanding in my field yes terrible jokes abound but at the same time i'm just going to have to re-diagnose you and be skeptical about the result if it turns out you have a terrible reaction to this medication so Galen says in ancient times that actually meant uh, some doctors were very into skepticism. So Sextus's outline, he mentions Sextus. Sextus's outlines of skepticism is composed of three books. The first book is a general argument for the skepticism of Pyrrho and Anesidemus, including Anesidemus's famous ten tropes. The second and third books are specifically concerned with attacking particular opponents' positions. The second book focused on epistemology and logic, on how we know and how we argue, and the third book on ethics and physics, what we know about the cosmos and the individual. Sextus begins by saying that in any matter being investigated, we could either A, assert we have found the truth, B, deny that any truth can be known, or C, continue to investigate. The first, he says, is dogmatism, we know, which includes Aristotle, Epicurus, and the Stoics, which actually seems decently accurate representation. I will follow him here. Whether or not you or I like him, I do like skepticism and subjectivity and these sorts of folks and Taoists in China and Buddhists in India and then in China. But, and they give very similar arguments with similar articulations, similar tropes, similar modes, similar practices of doubting and believing and doubting. But the first is dogmatism, uh, and that's Aristotle, Epicurus, and the Stoics, and they do seem deliberately more dogmatic than the skeptics, and they do not like the skeptics. Again, Aristotle says, skeptics and Heraclitus know better than plants, these jerks. Sextus says early in the work that the Stoics are his chief dogmatic opponents. We will actually have them last. I could give them next. Might be nice. Technically, we're going to give Epicurus next. He is slightly ahead of the Stoics, I believe. The second is the position of the academics, that would be Plato, near the tree grove of the academy, which was not the fancy building, mall-like building it looks in the painting, such as uh, Cletomachus and Carnid Carniades, it's not, uh, and he had a daughter named Carnitas, perhaps, you know, mm, yes, delicious. The third position is that of skeptics, he says. So you have the dogmatists, who are certain they're right, nihilists, he says, who deny any truth can be known. He says that's Plato. Now, this is another big piece of evidence, by the way. We've been walking through a lot of Plato, haven't we? Sextus says Plato's account... Now, he is much later. He is living more in Roman times, when Greece has decently fallen from grace, and now Rome is the power and the might and all of that in his life. And he says... So the Pla Plata, the Platonists, sort of Neoplatonists, semi here, getting their act decently together over hundreds of years and thousands of years, these guys are nihilists, effectively, which is not skepticism. So anybody is like, well, truth is subjective. Oh, well, that's nothing at all. Um, it is very much I always emphasize. Dogmatism is very about all or none. Skepticism is not about none, it is about some and some. This is a point I make often. When you read Taoism and Buddhism, a lot of times you could go, oh, life is but a dream, therefore it's nothing. 
well, that doesn't mean everything and nothing. It means something and then doesn't mean something else and is sort of half-truth. Half-truth is not no truth, and they're positioning their half-truths better, they believe, than dogmatists. Ske Sextus specifically says this because, and I have been inspired by this in many other works, to read Taoism and Buddhism very much in the same way. I heard somebody give a talk actually recently in which they were a white guy like me and like, Buddhism is illusion, it's illusion, it's all illusion. Well, I don't like that kind of talk because, yes, but if you said, oh, life is but a dream, but a dream, but a dream, okay, but see, I can make much more concrete comparisons with Greek skepticism and Buddhism. So it's not just a dream, they're attacking certain beliefs and they believe in doing that and they feel that human feelings are partial and that's what they're doing. So when Sexta says they're dogmatists, they're nihilists, and we ain't either of those, we're skeptics, he means we're the middle, yes, flipping us all off a little bit here, I won't lower the other fingers, although you can see what I'm doing anyway if I did, Yes, right in front of your face, right? Look, I'm flipping you off. You just can't tell, right? It's perfectly safe for children. Not really. Is that, yeah, effectively, uh, what I'm doing is not dogmatism. I'm not doing nihilism. I'm doing some and some, not all or none. He says this very clearly. That's what Taoists and Buddhists believe, and they are accused in their cultures of nihilism, you know, of being like, no, we're just trying to destroy belief. No, I can see some and some, therefore I can see better than you. The pragmatist would tell the positivist in American philosophy, I can come up with more fruitful theories if they're some and some rather than all or none. The positivist may say that's worthless interpretation unless it's perfectly objective. The pragmatist would say, watch me. You know what I mean? Watch me put this into practice. I would say the same about my lectures. If you think me uh, that I believe too much in subjectivity or skepticism, well, watch me make historical connections that can mean something to you, and I openly invite you to take it either way. I do very much believe that and love teaching these classes because of that. So when Sextus says here in ancient Greek skepticism, no, by subjectivity, I specifically mean not all or none objective, some and some subjective, he is specifically calling Plato and his followers a bunch of nihilists and suggesting they're a bunch of cowards who can't investigate. They got all mystified by the sun above and they turned to Parmenidean to actually be Pythagorean enough to actually investigate how math are imperfect practices in the real world rather than in culture and media, rather than something necessarily perfect and divine from above in human thought form. Here we again have uh, Xenophanes is a very early Greek skeptic, although he isn't one of their crew, because we use the word skeptic after these guys. There's the beeping outside again is that he effectively says, no, horses and oxen would carve the gods to look like them. That doesn't say horses and oxen would carve no gods or it's absolutely useless to have any gods. Let's not. He does not say that. And that's not what he means. When Socrates says, I pursue the good vaguely, but I don't know exactly what it is. Early Plato Socrates that doesn't mean Socrates shuts up and doesn't talk to anyone. Again, Socrates believes he is more powerful than others in being skeptical. He clearly demonstrates that with his entire career, in the words of Plato anyway, as best we have it. So, that said, that is a very important point to do uh, dwell upon. So, rather than the dogmatists and the Aristotelians, or the nihilists and the Platonists, which is a weird distinction to make for many, but it historically shows you at that time, Aristotle had not taken over Plato's academy. It had been taken over by Plato's nephew, and then they had waxed into something more like the illusion mysteries, perhaps, and Parmenidean mysticism, and like, well, all is one, I don't know, you know what I mean? We debate everything, but then there's just sort of everything is kind of everything. Sextus says early uh, that the, the Stoics are his, do his chief dogmatists. Plato's Academy is going strong as the skeptics. The third position is that of, uh, I'm sorry, of the nihilists. And the third position is that of the skeptics, who continue to investigate and describe things as they appear. Pyrrho is the first, according to Sextus, Sextus says he gets the credit, to have systematically and thoroughly committed himself to skepticism. With forerunners, as already mentioned, that Sextus talks about. The second position, a pessimistic skepticism, Sextus identifies with the members of Plato's Academy long after Plato, is not for Sextus genuine skepticism, but a dogmatic nihilistic position that knowledge and truth are completely impossible. The French might tell you in postmodernism, truth it is impossible, but they are trying to be rhetorical and freak you out. They don't mean no one ever means anything to anybody. Um, but they do know that that is how the words will be interpreted. It is similar to, I mentioned just recently, it's like Taoists believe in non-action. And you're like, so never act and starve. No, they believe in less action, so they know that when the French say truth, well, they wouldn't know, truth is impossible. Like, that doesn't mean it's all entirely impossible. It's just full, perfect truth is impossible. And they understand how the words are being heard 
uh, back and forth. Similar with the Taoists saying Wu Wei don't act. They know they're called cowards and fools, but they say no. Non-action is less action, patience, and that's what wins. We don't care about ego and pride. That's what wins. Which is, Taoism has been compared to Stoicism decently. We will not get into that right here. So, Sextus says... And unlike the Stoics, who believe in grasping objective knowledge, and unlike the Taoists, Sextus says, by suspending judgment, we can achieve tranquility. Again, the, everybody here very much believes in tranquility, rather than absolute powerful happiness, as mentioned uh, in the last talk. Ataraxia. Clearly, the suspension of judgment is not a suspension of investigation, and neither is achieving tranquility. Judgment is suspended such that more investigation is possible, and the tranquility achieved is an opening of the individual mind to the greater pursuit of truth. Skepticism is the development of an ability to investigate, an ability hindered by all dogmas. In the Chinese Taoist text, the Shuangzi, it says similarly, you cannot discuss the way of things with a cramped scholar. They are shackled by their doctrines, which doctrines could be alternatively translated as dogmas. Sextus says that skepticism is the ability to think. When we take a position on a matter dogmatically, we are limiting ourselves from taking the contrary position, from thinking that which contradicts our position. If we find a position to be quite true and then take it up as our position, we block ourselves from taking the opposite position, which may also be true in other ways, times, or places, as Buddhist debaters would say versus Hindus, who would say the soul is, uh, is eternal. Is it always, in all times, in all places, eternal? Is the world? Is my, are, is, are my perspectives? For this reason, the best position is to have no particular position entirely, but be situational, realizing that various positions can coexist complexly in ways that dogmatic systemization cannot capture. Sort of like doctors need, with all of medicine, needing to re-diagnose you each time. Peronians, unlike any other school, develop this ability to its utmost, and thus achieve a calming of the soul, ataraxia, peace, tranquility. Other schools sought truth dogmatically, thinking that they would achieve tranquility once they found what is simply true and what is simply false. Unfortunately for dogmatists, for every position there is a counterposition. For every truth, there is a countertruth. Recognizing this, Peronians hold no beliefs as absolute, and thus can freely assert or deny any position as needed. As I often mentioned, you know, Aristotle, uh, as an aside here, in his ethics, we did not go over Aristotle's logic yet because I am going to save that talk uh, for another time. Again, please study up on Aristotle's logic uh, as you can through my notes. Is that Aristotle's logic is very ach trying to achieve black and white and all or none, but in his ethics, Aristotle is very much baby bear balance. So the odd thing is, is that if you follow Aristotle's ethics and then you push that all the way out to epistemology and what is true, the skeptics are very much in terms of balance, as are Taoists, as are Buddhists, the middle way and the mean. Confucians also talk about the way in the middle mean, but oddly, like Aristotelians, Confucius is more dogmatic and says, well, you balance ethics out, but by the way, you want more black and white closure and certainty like Stoics and Aristotle. Oddly enough, the Taoists of China would say, well, that's not really balanced, uh, a la the ethics, and it's the same with the skeptics. They would say, but all or none truth is not balanced in the middle of some and some. They all fit together, again, with these simple pieces. You can see the pieces fit together, and I do believe that is very much the ways that these pieces are being debated and felt and pushed back and forth with each other, as they still are positivism, pragmatism, back and forth in analytic philosophy in America, still today, as its influences. While Pyrrhonists and Peronians, same thing, hold no beliefs, this does not mean that they do not have impressions or cannot give descriptions. To believe one's beliefs are true is to assert something that is unclear. It, almost, it also will be wise to look for beliefs in yourself and not just declare yourself to not believe in things. So, it's not to say that everything is false dogmatically, as this would not be suspension of belief. That would be nihilism, and dogmatic nihilism. Rather, one should we believe in nothing, Lebowski. Who's the nihilist here, you know? Rather, one should describe one's own impressions, without feeling the need to extend these impressions into beliefs. Sextus says that Peronia, Peronia, Peronianism, Pyrrhonism, is not a school if a school is defined by its beliefs, but if a school is an orientation on how to live life and think, then Pyrrhonism is a school. I often mention with Wittgenstein, and I love Wittgenstein, it is not about rules or beliefs. Look for practices. Look for, and I highly recommend that, instead of looking for, I was definitely taught at a time in grad school 
where it is more in vogue now, and this is good, it is more Wittgensteinian and now, whether or not people are quoting Wittgenstein, to say you don't go looking for the ten beliefs of Buddhism that are always the beliefs of Buddhism. What you go looking for is Buddhist practices in Thailand and China, and then often they would have the same beliefs. But what you're going to find is not the beliefs hanging in midair as bullet points, even though that's what you try to put in the lecture notes. I do anyway. I don't know what you're trying to put in my lecture notes. You know, how did the tiger get in my pajamas already? If you're going through stuff, you're looking for Buddhist living thought, and then they also say things they believe. So the talk and the texts and the rituals are all practice, whether or not they punch homeless people and get bad karma for it. So look for practices, not beliefs. That's something I very much believe in teaching people. Whether or not you believe in objectivity or subjectivity or all of the range of all of that, keep that in mind. And that's especially something I weave into, especially from a historical, psychological perspective, like the kind I got from my studies here in this town is that you're looking for, you are looking for beliefs and philosophy, but what you are also looking for in order to see a belief, how would you see or hear it? You are looking for physical, mental practices. So Pirro says here very helpfully, skepticism is not really a set of bullet points or a text. It's more of a set of techniques. And I would actually say whether or not he, he would argue this, dogmatism is itself a set of techniques. It's not necessarily a bullet point of here's everything we've absolutely proved in medicine. It is a kind of attitude towards thought or medicine, which a skeptic would have the opposite attitude or thought. And what's an attitude? Does an attitude just hang floating in midair or is it metaphysical in realms beyond? No, it's a physical mental practice of emotions and test tubes and people in physical circumstances. That's what you can see. And so Pyrrhonism and skepticism are where they exist in China and India and Greece are sets of debate practices and thus hopefully and perhaps minimalism in life and practices in life as well that branch into debate life and everything the Taoists say you are the the most important thing you're ever doing and working on so this makes Pyrrhonism both a school and not a school and so it is neither a school nor not and that would be more the same and some and some Pyrrhonists like other dogmatic schools should study the natural sciences he says but primarily such that all dogmatic belief can be opposed against the professors, against the mathematicians. Yeah, we get it. We get it. Not to assert dogmatic belief about any subject against the dogmatists would be the more comprehensive, more well-read work rather than the specialist works against the mathematicians and musicians. And everything else Big Bird says starts with the letter M. So if skepticism rejects beliefs, can it say nothing? Sextus says that things do appear to be the case. And that the way things appear should continue to be investigated. Here is not sit back and nihilistically stare into the sun. Just as things are perceived differently by various animals and perceived differently at various times and from various positions, the way that things do appear to ourselves and others is investigated by the skeptic. Here is an interesting example, especially in California. I grew up Californian. You would be hearing uh, English teachers often have you learn about American history through marginalized perspectives. Yes, you read books. I had a friend of mine, he had to read in L.A. growing up. He had to read a book call, uh, called Chasing the Sun or something like that. And it's about a uh, boy of Aztec heritage and he's learning how to run and he has a pair of running shoes. I believe that is the book. I'd have to actually look it up. But it's something called Chasing the Sun. And my friend used to love to sleep in in college like heck. And he's like, that's the story of my life. That's going to be the storm of the title of my autobiography chasing the sun because of course he's never up when the sun's around you know or he wasn't I'm pretty sure he uh yeah he's steadily employed now you know it's like chasing the sun you know for the aztec boy is working in marginalized perspectives yes because say you have like a bunch of dominant perspectives then you have well the aztec boy you know of aztec heritage he is trying to come up in the world and race and do good and we're learning about things through his eyes well why would an english teacher in california have you go through all of that and most likely your english teacher may be white like me well because it's very popular nowadays especially since the 80s work of bell hooks and others to uh, emphasize marginalized perspectives and i like that fine some people don't of course that's very historical but why is that going on in classrooms because you have the dogmatism and the skepticism and you have the marginalized voices rather than the main dogmatic beliefs or practices or um or feelings etc and so it's a back and a forth that's why you have marginalized perspectives so much throughout english classes today and i like it fine so, and again, their eyes were watching the one, you know, etc. 
Uh, yes, our soul may be tired after all of this, but perhaps our feet are rested if we just talk, talk, talk all day long. So, basically, like dogmatists, uh, Sextus says that skeptics have standards, but their standards are not convictions, but processes. Not statements about reality, but activities of investigation. Neither dogmatists nor skeptics can be entirely inactive. We all naturally perceive, think, desire, value, and teach. Sextus says that all this can be done skeptically without convictions or dogmas. I mentioned in the Indian philosophy class, when I'm, uh, as I'm getting through Indian skepticism and the basics of Jainism and Buddhism, why can they tell you anything then? And I mentioned then it's that they talk as if, if I have a more skeptical view, I can tell you more so A, B, C, but do it with a wider mind and say, well, how can you tell me A, B, and C at all if you're skeptical? Because the person who knows A and not A can tell you more so A here, kid, and kind of push you more towards that at the right time. Whether or not that's correct, that would be the justification. Whenever we know some and some in life, well, better A than B here, you know? And that's what they would say. So it's not inactivity or nihilism. Like Aristotle, Sextus argues that all things have their own aim or purpose. This is a very old school, old world, things are full of life, and Thales, all things are full of gods and spirits. Skepticism aims at tranquility and moderation, which seems like that is the tuning fork and what you should platonically do and putting your ducks in the row and we're naturally in tune with nature and Buddha talks that way too and is as skeptical as Sextus. While Aristotle argued for the achievement of purpose and moderation, unlike Sextus and skeptics, Aristotle aimed for universal truths uncontradicted by genuine opposition. That is substantive or evident. That's logic. Sextus argues that skeptics too seek truth and act towards aims, but they are enabled by the tranquility achieved through suspension of judgment, excuse me, of moving beyond the aim for uncontradicted truths. Dogmatists must, must commit themselves, Sextus says, to deciding whether particular things are good or bad by nature with an intensity that prevents them from thinking, feeling, and acting in moderation, altogether in concert. It is indeed an odd paradox in the philosophy of Aristotle, again as mentioned, that Aristotle very much believed in things like what we now call the principles of non-contradiction and the excluded middle, which is more nah, is Leibniz and Kant and then Russell, an analytic philosophy. But in his ethics, he believes in the doctrine of the mean, much like Confucius, who again, as said, is dogmatic about plenty, does not believe in being a Taoist, doesn't like those hippie bums. But oddly, when it comes to ethics... We're supposed to have balance, and it strangely, Aristotle and Confucius sort of turn into perfectly happy with skepticism and some and some when it comes to ethics, and they think that is baby bear theory, the middle way of the road. As does Buddha. Many people talk about balance and middle way, but not when they get black and white, and there are times to be black and white, not racist, but black and white is in, well, all or none got to make a judgment call here throughout life. And how do we do that wisely and well? Well, the Taoist and Sextus would say, do it a bit less day by day, and that'll hopefully help you get confident and competent and grow in making some and some choices in life. It's good to bring up here the Buddhist Zen expression, you do not use a sledgehammer to swat a fly. You can, but then it's bad art, you know, and uh, you've ruined your, uh, your deposit. Again, maybe you have rent control, but we won't much if you do that a whole lot. So, yeah, by uh, we attain greater truth, we are enabled to seek truth, and we avoid dogmatic judgments and convictions if we are skeptical, a la Sextus. Sextus tells us a story to illustrate, one that is very modern art and Pollock, um, a American abstract minimalism. Apelles, or Ap Apelles, Apelles, a painter like Pirro, was trying to paint the lather of a horse's mouth in battle. Apparently there's a bunch of horses there rearing back all in a battle and freaking out as horses somewhat do. The horse is lathering because the horse is all intense and he needs to paint this lather correctly and he can't and he can't and he can't. After trying and trying again and again out of frustration without thinking, Apelles flung his sponge for removing paint at the image of the horse, not even a proper tool for painting. And accidentally, it produced the perfect representation he had been seeking all along. This is remarkably parallel with modern art, with Dadaism and Surrealists. And these guys not only know their philosophy and their ancient Greek stuff sometimes, these are people in Europe who like grooving out to Taoism and Buddhism more than other types of folks. So, they use automism, or automatism, 
Autumnism, I've heard it both ways. I think Autumnism is the correct word. To create their works, recognizing, like ancient Peronians, that rational planning is actually a process that is not entirely rational or planned or in our control. Modern artists often create works using plans and then allow the work to form itself. This is very famous in modern art. A good example I once heard of mannerism in film is make a plan like, I'm going to walk 13 blocks from my house. I'm going to see something cool. I'm going to film it. I'm then going to turn left. I'm going to walk three blocks and then I'm going to film something. And then I'm going to walk eight blocks to the north. I'm going to film something. That's the film. I'm going to declare that right now. This was popular for a while as mannerism in film. I think during the 70s and 80s, I believe I'm not the film guy, but I try to vicariously, you know, I try to know some art to plug in here. And these guys like philosophy, women, men, unsung women. So when they make a, uh, I'm going to, and then they make a, a brilliant film and you're like, wow, you know, David Lynch somewhat does this a lot is that he sort of lets the work form itself. And then it's like, wow, you're brilliant. And David Lynch will tell you, but the work and reality flows with and through me. So I'm not that brilliant. I'm using reality as it comes to me, like flinging it just out of frustration, flinging the thing at the thing. There was a, uh, for instance, there was a Netflix thing about, there's a Japanese artist and he paints by boxing and punching the canvas with boxing gloves. These things are all decades old somewhat, but that's a Japanese uh, avant-garde artist trying to splatter you know and kind of uh scream splattering allowing the work even more obscene things than that got popular in the 70s and 80s a la bataille i will not tell you about you know raise my insurance premiums on this place or my activities here my processes but yeah all, uh, allowing nature allowing the plan to not be planned but some and some is very popular in modern art this throwing the sponge at the wall don't obviously just fling things but when artists fling things, when Pollock drizzles paint, that is in a long tradition. And not all of these people have ever heard of uh, Pelles or Sextus, but they do know artists who are all into art. And at some point, somebody's read some philosophy or not. So, the fluid and effortless creation is the aim of skepticism too. It's like art. And Taoists say you are the artwork that's most important to work on the most important work and artwork in your life, but achieved in thought the way that a great painter achieves it in paint. Skeptics, like everyone else, are disturbed by things such as cold and thirst, but unlike many, they act without thinking. They must aim at convictions, at uncontradicted judgments, and so are more capable of acting in moderation when disturbed. I often like to joke with the class, I want a burrito right now. Then I'm going to go have a burrito. I'm not going to want a burrito anymore. Do I have to come to convictions I need a burrito? Of course not, because situationally, and burritos are damned important. Well, they are to me, but food is, right? Whether or not it's in burrito form, uh, the savages, is that they, uh, again, the taco truck will show up pretty soon, uh, do La Cucaracha at some point, probably after this video, uh, with awesome food stuffs. So even though food's important, do you need to come to the conviction you're always hungry or you need food? No. Why? Because your body tells you when you do, and you don't need convictions about when you eat food. Well, it's nice to have a good diet, but if you if your ducks are all in a row, you should not be having to plan out your diet much, right? Because you get up and eat the oatmeal when you need to, or whatever it happens. So you shouldn't have to plan your diet out a whole lot if you're living simply and living well, living happily, right? So what sort of convictions do you need to come to to have a healthy diet? Well, not many, if you're just cool with it and healthy and minimalistic. If you don't have to come to convictions, I need to eat food tonight because your body will be hungry. Uh, your body is ready. Yes, a la anime. It's like, well, then your body will tell you when it's needed. You don't need beliefs and convictions about it. And that's sort of what the Taoistically skeptics are like. But your body will tell you when somebody's a jerk. Your mind will tell you when you need to face off against the right kind of person. You don't have to have convictions about people ahead of time, who they are. You can face jerks when they're jerks, you know, like eat food when you're hungry. That would be, if it's food, I mean, if you cannot have convictions about food and when to eat, you certainly don't need to have convictions about jerks. That's just getting all bound up in your mind. You know, as Lao Tzu says, the Taoist, that's just letting people all be in your head. There's a great Taoist text where some uh, an old guy goes to see Lao Tzu in the Lietza, the third Taoist text, and Lao Tzu, the old master, says, why'd you bring this whole crowd with you? The guy wheels around and there's no one there. It's all in his mind. He's bringing people with him. So why do you have to have all this convictions and clutter in your head, all the underbrush, as Zhuang Tzu says? So how are we supposed to do this? Now that I've ranted and raved a bunch passionately about how we're supposed to empty and clear ourselves out, how are we supposed to suspend judgment? 
Well, I teach philosophy a lot. Sextus says that it comes about through opposition, through opposing appearance against counterappearance and opinion and position and theory against counteropinion, position and theory. And that, kids, is not only debate, it's philosophy, crosswise, as Sextus puts it. An example, he gives a tower which has flat sides appearing around from a distance. We can consider another similar example from an educational children's show I watched when I was very young. I don't remember the name of it. I've tried to figure it out. There's a little cartoon in the middle of it, and there's a couple of shapes that rob a bank. And they have little uh, robber masks, and they're various like purple and red colored shapes. And they rob a bank, and they run away. And there's a witness on the street across the street, and they talk to the cops, and they're like, okay, it was a triangle and a triangle and a square. But somebody was on the roof across the street, another street, and they're like, well, no, it was a circle and a circle and a square. And the cops are like, well, wait a minute. It was a triangle, and a, two triangles and a square, or it was two circles and a square. Well, it was a square, so it may have been a cube. What was all that? Well, it turns out it wasn't a cube at all, as they simply tell you as a child, and it's totally stuck in my head. I was like, this is brilliant, you know. Again, children love Cookie Monster and Oscar the Grouch because they're weird and different, but opposite specifically, and children love opposite behavior and soaking it up like this. It turns out that from one side, a cone, a pyramid, and a cylinder look like a triangle, a triangle, and a square, but from above, there's no cube involved. Because from above, the square is actually two of the different pieces at different times. Because from above, a cone, a cylinder, both look like not a triangle and a square, but a circle and a circle. And then a pyramid looks from above like a square. So the triangle, triangle, uh, triangle, triangle square from above actually turns out to be a uh, circle, square, triangle, which is very zen, actually. Um, so, yeah, that stuck with me since I'm young. Thanks to my moms for the uh, educational cartoons. I was somewhat force fed as a kid, you know, rather than G.I. Joe, you know. Uh, and yeah, with all of that kind of stuff. You have perspective. Children love soaking it up in Sesame Street. Uh, that's what psychologists are engineering for them because not only do children respond to it, psychologists hope uh, children are watching perspectives of others because that's why they're having them read Chasing the Sun. And probably my friend uh, was hiding in bed from everyone. Yes, because people have perspectives and it's terrible. Another example, Sexus says that against those who believe in providence, fate that the cosmos is ordered such that good will gain and bad will lose. That's a very popular idea the whole world over. This can be opposed by examples of the good doing badly and the bad doing well, by which it appears that there is no providence or cosmic order. So those are the two opposed views of Socrates and Thrasymachus, actually. There is fairness, we just tarry towards it. No, there isn't. Might makes right. People would have known of this text and known of Plato, and he's like, no, life is, uh, as I often say, the skeptics say, life is fair and life is unfair, intertangled. And that's right. In fact, uh, as I've been watching a lot of terrible existentialist films, I was watching uh, Melancholia the other night with friends, and you would think that life is unfair and rich people have it easy, but then you listen to rich people talk and you realize life is fair and everybody has the same emotions and rich people are often sad as all living heck and full of pride and stupid. Well, why? Well, because life is fair and unfair and no matter how much money you have, which is unfair, life is brutally in the head, which is very, very fair. In that somebody, uh, Sartre says, some poor jerk who's, you know, just blowing leaves looks at you funny. Now they've taken away your whole white, you know, uh, collared existence and they can do that like that. And so life is fair and life is unfair, isn't it? If we all have the same human mind. And if I'm saying these words, you snap right into them. Life is fair and unfair and that we all share this human mind. That again is very much high-ended philosophy given everything we've studied in simple, simple words and concepts because Sextus is coming along in Roman times when people know who Plato, Aristotle, Stoics, and all these folks are. And he's talking a mad game of smack against everybody. So several mad games of smack, some and some quite powerfully. So again, Sextus, without mentioning any of this, is saying actually Socrates and Thrasymachus are both right, and that's why they're both there. And you can see that. And if they're both, if those both opinions are still here, then you can see that. After thousands of years in a very different culture and much under the bridge, huh? 
So do things work for good or do things work out to be evil? Both. Continuously. In life. Look at it. There it is. How are things going to change? Ha <laughs> ha. I'll bet next week they're going to be working themselves into good and evil. As the Taoists say, yeah, good and evil, they work real nearby each other in the same business park. I'm telling you. You know, it's almost like they're in the next cubicles over and they're all involved in the same stuff. I don't trust the bastards. Do you? Sextus presents the ten tropes of anesthetemus at length, cautioning that this is not a list of all possible modes, nor should it imply that each of these is equally powerful in particular circumstances. He gives many examples, which may or may not be his own or those of skeptics before him. Animals with different eyes, he says, will perceive colors differently. He actually says that. And some animals can see in the dark. Which is true. It's again, that's, well, people live with animals around animals. They figured that by observation. Colored lights and curved mirrors change appearances, he says. It's a little bit of ancient uh, special effects. Food becomes various parts of animal bodies, as water becomes various parts of plants. That's a little Anaxagoras, again, with the horses and the salt. Different finger positions make the breath of, through a flute and the string on the lyre produce high and low notes. Same substance, different position, totally different meaning, totally different note. And sound is invisible, but it's there, like the meaning, to the form of the words. Unlike humans, insects hate perfume and olive oil, he says. So we like what keeps insects away, and it also keeps insects away, which is another reason to like it. Sextus includes examples given by Heraclitus. Sea water is drinkable to fish, and pigs bathe in mud. Sextus says, unlike the deluded and self-satisfied dogmatists who ri ridicule animals and those they disagree with as irrational, skeptics know to compare the various ways of animals, similar and different from each other, to the various convictions of humanity. Several times Sextus says, the so-called irrational animals, I happen to like this point a lot, Wittgenstein's into dogs and whether or not they can think or use language at all, it says a dog can't expect uh, his master Thursday for just this sort of reason, not to uh, split ourselves apart from animals, but actually talk about, so how are we practicing things different with words from dogs and cats? Because that's important. Especially if you live with them, you can see that, and that would be some and some, not all or none. So in a move sure to please Diogenes, Sextus says even, uh, even dogmatists must admit that dogs, often thought to be the lowest of animals, are far more capable than humans at perception through sight, sound, and smell, which is why humans in ancient times used them for hunting. Dogs are great hunters and courageous defenders, Sextus says. Here in the Lietza, in every way, every slave is better than the emperor. A dog is superior to humanity in smell and in, even in sight in ways. There you go. Like animals, humanity has various minds and bodies and thus has various opinions and feelings, Sextus says. He may be a doctor. He may know that medication works differently on different people or they may like different tastes or not. Sextus uses the example of a body of a Scythian, like those Aristotle said had no intoxication, therefore had no flute players. He does say that in his logic work. Uh, to the body of an Indian, like an Indian in Roman times, where they're getting indigo and dyes and other stuff. And Columbus eventually wanted to get all the way around to get that kind of stuff and cut out the middleman of Islam and the rates and the taxes and the algebra calculations of merchants. So death and taxes, yes, always coming for you. So Piro says, uh, he says that the Indians, like Piro met while traveling with Alexander, are different and says Greeks and Indians enjoy different things. He actually decides, like Piro went to India, Sextus is weirdly saying Greeks and Indians enjoy different things and using India. He says some people enjoy beef more than fish. Others get sick from lesbian wine, which, of course, we don't talk about lesbian wine anymore much. That is, uh, and yeah, that would be from Lesbos, not Sappho's own press. Um... Full court. Legend has it that an old woman who lived near Athens, Sextus says, could consume hemlock without harm, which clearly makes her different from Socrates, and no, that is not lost on the audience. Some individuals are immune to common poisons. Others are allergic to common goods. Sextus says that if our bodies differ so, and if the body is an image of the soul, it is likely that our souls differ as well. Modern psychology confirms this today, as we do share a, a generally similar mind to all of humanity while varying individually, sometimes in profound ways. In fact, here I do think of The Princess Bride. The book is even better than the movie, although the movie has classic bits that are not in the book that people love. But in there, never tr uh, trust a Sicilian when death is on the line. 
And how can you enter into a situation with poison? In fact, the Dread Pirate Roberts masked dude brings the poison himself. It is, in fact, the poison. The guy's like, it's not the poison. No, it is the poison. Why is he able to react the way he is? Because he slowly conditioned himself against the poison such that he has a completely different perspective of the poison than the guy he is duping into the battle. Which allows him to easily pass right through it because even though the average person would be poisoned and dead from the poison, if you have slowly conditioned yourself as a particular individual to not be poisoned, then you're not entering into the situation thinking like the other and you can see and think that and see that clearly, which is exactly that scene and why that scene works so well. I almost do wonder if the author, who was an awesome guy, I forget his name, of The Princess Bride, he was a screenwriter who wrote the book after screenwriting, and then it became a movie pretty much, I think, around the same time and ish, is that, yeah, I would like to think he was thinking of this and was well-educated in the Greek stuff, have no reason to not think so, and so when it's this, well, some individuals are actually immune to hemlock or condition themselves slowly to poisons, yeah, that's actually very much possibly the inspiration for the Princess Bride scene. I would like to think, but perhaps, again, that was just come up with and quite independently. The thing is, that guy likes to play on pretty brilliant, you know, sorts of stuff. Just like this. Truck outside likes to play with my emotions. Smokey. Old people are affected by temperature more than young people, says. And there it passes. But young people are affected by color and sound more than old people. Even though, yeah, which is why I'm getting all old and pissy about this thing outside. Showing that in some ways the old are more sensitive to perceptions, while in others the young are. Lamps, which seem bright at night, are dim in daytime. It's a bit of Diogenes. When in motion, such as on a boat, Sextus says, things that are standing still appear to be in motion. But from far away, things such as boats that are in motion seem to stand still. Things which we feel are shameful when sober, he says, are enjoyable when drunk. Never been there, don't know. The same wine seems sour after dates or figs, sweet after nuts or beans. There is, uh, I believe it is Diogenes who says that if we did not, uh, if you listen to that talk, if we did not have honey, figs and dates would be far sweeter, he says. Why? Because they would be the sweetest thing. And so we would not have sweeter. They would be as sweet as possible. Whether or not, again, there could be right or wrong to that a little. But at the same time, you get the point of what he is saying. Sextus says here, and I do like giving this, it's a memorable example because it's very visceral and touch oriented. So it's easy to remember. And it's also very Greek because of public bathhouses in, in Turkey and Hungary. They still have public bathhouses. You go and you go take a bath, you know, in the pool and get whipped by juniper branches or something. People are cold after exiting the warm public bathhouse, but they were not cold before they entered. So the heat conditioned the individual over a small period of time to feel heat and cold differently. Well, like food, heat and cold are danged important to a mammal, to a warm-blooded mammal, right? Well, if your body can differently perceive heat and cold in food at different times, then clearly there's something basic to perception that is perspective. Uh, and different sides of the elephant here. We can see in the individual in and out of the bathhouse over an hour. While the dogmatists argue about what is universal and common to all, Sextus argues, uh, arguing that Plato or Epicurus is exclusively right, dogmatically, Plato says that poets and playwrights have a better understanding. Artists are better than philosophers, knowing all too well the tragedy that follows from various feelings and convictions. The Taoists say, if you want to be a brilliant guy, learn to think like a woman. If you want to be a great philosopher, Sextus says, think like an artist. Those are not unrelated thoughts, although I mean nothing sexist nor misogynistic about them at all. Uh, sincerely, that those are interrelated thoughts. Use your feelings, Luke. And it is, uh, as Bruce, Bruce Lee says, don't think, feel. And that is better. The dogmatists claiming to know exclusively the truth are themselves part of the dispute and angry and pissed off. Evidence that one must take a position on a matter to see things a certain way. The various dogmatic schools opposed to each other as well as to skepticism show that dogmatism is insufficient for investigating truth. I am going to do a lot more videos over the winter on the wonderful aspect that in detectives, uh, that in Poe's detective stories and in Lewis Carroll's work on Wonderland and the Looking Glass, both Poe and Carol definitely say at certain times to friends and in letters, but also say in their work 
that most people are not very brilliant. Why is that? Well, you would think they could just math their way to brilliance, but these guys can't feel for other people. So I can feel for other people and use my emotions, which means I am truly brilliant. Both Poe and Carol say that. Uh, Poe says you need to be both a poet and a mathematician to be truly brilliant. And Poe thinks he is brilliant and courting many a young lady, try to be brilliant in front of him all at the same time. He was courting many young women saying, how can you have anyone other than me in your life? And he said that to several people at a time. So whether or not you or I like Poe or his convictions or his practices and processes, Poe, like Lewis Carroll, is like, no, if you really want to be brilliant, be an artist and a poet. Why? Because, as Poe's Detective Dupont says, the truth will always be simple and stupid. Why? Humanity. Watch the process patiently. The truth, the deepest and most brilliant of truth, will always be simple and stupid. And here Sextus is thus saying, no, the poets and the playwrights get it better. Dupont, uh, uh, Poe's detective, actually says in modern times... And I've been watching too many movies like this lately. If you tell a modern mathematician that math is not the architecture of the world and absolutely true, take a step back because they will try to knock you out. Does that seem like a mathematician's over their emotions? Watch them. They're not. It's because math is not the only route to humanity. You need emotions and emotional brilliance and to be a fine, good artist as a thinker in order to have good concepts. I am going to yammer about that point a lot. A lot. Just not going to do it all right now. But yeah, it dovetails very well because Sextus says, be an artist. That's actually superior to a lot of these verbal, uh, rational, quotey, quotey, thinkers with a lot of knowledge. Are they good at the processes? Are they good at interacting with humanity? If a mathematician isn't good at interacting with you and talking to you, are they really that brilliant or capable of great brilliance or profundity at all? Or even what mathematicians call elegance without considering the other? or uh, all the others who helped them build a system. Possibly not, as ideal as math may feel. Feel for Nietzsche. Feel it fits for Wittgenstein. Are we aware of the feelings? The dogmatists claiming to exclusively know the truth are part of the dispute, evidence that one must take a position on a matter to see things a certain way. The various dogmatic schools, opposed to each other as well as to skepticism, just like I'm opposed to the beeping that's been going on for 10 minutes without break, Show that dogmatism is insufficient for investigating truth. Similar to the Eleatic infinite regress of place and Zeno and form in Plato's Parmenides, Sextus argues that if we want to prove what we think is exclusively true, then we would have to prove that our proof is true, and then prove that this proof is true, resulting in a similar infinite regress. Uh, Sextus repeats several times, everything, therefore, is relative. While dogmatists argue that some things are the best, others are the worst, that some things are clear, others are unclear, that some things are equal, fair, and other things are unequal, unfair, that some things are similar, and other things are different, all of these are relative, not absolute or exclusive. The Taoists say, try to be where you see a uh, 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 set of small hairs as a range of mountains. Speaking about the rare being striking, while at the same time, when common, is normal, the ninth trope of Anesidemus, Sextus argues that comets, earthquakes, and lightning are considered important and meaningful because they are rare, while the sun, which is far brighter, is not striking, it is, but the sun rising is not miraculous because it happens every day. Sunsa the third Confucian, not Sunsa the strategist, but a different guy, says almost exactly the same thing in ancient China, even though he's a very different thinker from Sextus, and I won't get all into that here. As he says, a lot of these astrologers and people, they think that when certain stars of the sun rise, <laughs> when certain stars or planets come into view, that's the most extraordinary thing in the world. But if we stop and think about it, well, the sun would be amazing if it rose once every hundred years and we didn't know it or something. So, and he uses the example of the sun rising. So he's like, so when this planet rises every hundred thousand years, that's nice. I mean, he's not, not into the gods and into the planets, but that's humanity sort of freaking out over something that happens rarer, which if you're wiser, you can see is not really a thing you got to do so much. It isn't that let's all be simple, cold materialists is not what he's saying or anything. But he is like, but these guys are freaking out over not much, you know, because, it, I mean, that's just human impressions and human emotions uh, by the rare, valuing the rare over the common. So similarly, Sextus says, 
The sun's far brighter than the planets, but it rises every day, so nobody cares so much, as much as the planet uh, or something, or the eclipse. Similarly, one who sees the sea for the first time finds it astonishing. I actually had uh, friends from Indiana came out a long time ago to visit me on the California coast, and they definitely, we went to the beach, and they were amazed, they were all into it, and one of them was like, wow, over across the water is China. I was like, no, I totally thought that when I was five and six and went to the beach. I'm like, China's way over there, you know, not to mock people from Indiana at all. Um, it's like, yeah, if you never see the beach, it's like, or see it personally, it's like when you get there for the first time, it's like, well, holy heck, China's over there. That's amazing you see it. And it's like, yeah, it is. It's incredible. It still is. It's just not very striking if you've been there several times in your childhood, you know, uh, continuously, sadly, even though it is still quite beautiful and striking if you don't go there every day. So again, uh, the Taoist Zhuangzi, my favorite Chinese philosopher, those uh, listening to the Taoist talks would know, a well frog says uh, BS to the turtle, I don't believe in the ocean, uh, water comes in a tube and in a well. That's what I've been living in, that's what it comes in. Dogmatism, closed tube, skepticism, open ocean. And the Taoist says, now I, uh, Zhuangzi says, now I can talk to you about the greater sea. Technically that's Joe of the North Sea says that, I don't know who that is. He's in the text. Sextus also says the human body would be astonishingly beautiful to us if we did not see it often. Uh, that's actually right now. The days we're during the pandemic. So, you know, I'm not seeing the human body as often as I would like to. I will leave that lying right there. Water would be expensive, Sextus says, if it was rare, and gold would be cheap if it was a common stone. In the Islamic tradition, Jesus says, I can walk on water because gold, mud, and hair are all equal in my eyes. Sextus says that recent skeptics, presumably those between Anesthedemus and himself, gave five modes of diff uh, different from the ten tropes for aiding in the suspension of judgment, and that he explains each and discusses types of reasoning that each is useful against. First, there is dispute, that matters are disputed among the common people and the wisest of philosophers alike. Second, there is ad infinitum. Infinite regress, such that those uh, as those employed by the Eleatics and Zeno, with the tortoise and the hare, that any argument would require an additional argument to confirm the argument, and any source would require an additional source to confirm the source. Especially if you've been paying attention to politics nowadays. Holy heck! Um, Third, there is relativity, that anything good is only so good, anything far is only so far. Fourth, there is the hypothetical, identical to the Sayadvada, principle of the Indian Jains. All beliefs are put forward hypothetically and fallible, possibly false, without absolute confirmation. Impossible given the second mode of ad infinitum. But you still put forward things tentatively, but not as convictions and rigid beliefs. Whether or not you call unrigid beliefs, beliefs. For, fifth and finally, there is the reciprocal, that any belief supported about a thing requires the thing to support the belief, resulting in circular reasoning. To know cows, cows have to exist, that, but they're mortal and they're changing. The skeptical ph uh, philosopher of science, Fire Abend, who I like a lot and I will do talks on next semester, who argued as a theoretical anarchist, he likes to call himself, that there is no particular scientific method. He wrote that many believe circular reasoning is wrong. But in fact, it is one of the most dominant forms of thought on the planet, and it often works just fine, which is a lot of what Sexus is observing here, and it's better and worse depending on how we do it. Our assumptions that the sun will rise tomorrow, or our culture is good, hooray, are circular circuits of thought that are normally undisturbed, and it's perfectly fine as long as you're not shooting anybody. We believe that the sun will rise because the sun has risen again and again. It is fine to believe this. How would you prove the sun will rise tomorrow? But should you not expect it? And the sun rising is pretty central, isn't it? To agriculture, to life, if it goes out, who are we? So if we then see the belief confirmed again and again, it is not proven the sun will rise tomorrow, but if, and if the earth is obliterated by a solar flare, the sun ceases rising above any kind of turning horizon at all. Uh, it doesn't rise in the earth doesn't turn. Sextus says these five modes which presumably are an attempt to boil down the ten tropes of Anesidemus, were further boiled down to two modes by the same unnamed skeptics. And here is the problem, not only of the continuous beeping outside, I have no other time to record these lectures, I swear, is that these are boiled down to the second and fifth modes of the previous five. Things must either be known in themselves, the circle, or known via something else, the line. Beeping dramatically pause there, thankfully. Life is fair and then unfair and then fair again. If things are known in themselves, it results in circular reasoning. If things are known in something other than themselves, it results in an infinite regress. 
There you go. An infinite regress of beeps in concert. Things can be relatively known in themselves and via other things, such as the forms of Plato, but they cannot be known absolutely without escaping the dual problem of the circular reasoning and the infinite regress. He does not call this the problem of the circle and the line. I call it, and I've heard other people somewhat say circle and the line. It's not my original expression. I call it the problem of the circle and the line, like the problem of the one and the many with the hand or some, or anything. It's very, uh, in fact, we can give here right at the end of the talk here, um, a very easy example. Let's say I go to Steve and I say, are you honest? He says, yes. How do I know Steve's honest? Well, I can trust him. We often do. And if somebody says I'm honest, you often can trust them circularly, but you also know that you can't do that alone. So then you say, okay, well, I'm going to ask Susan, Hey, can I trust Steve? Sure. What's the problem now? Well, we have a line from Steve to Susan, but we potentially have an infinite regress, right? Well, how do I know Susan? Well, I go ask Suzette. Well, what the heck? You know, then we go all the way to Paris and we ask says Suzette the third, you know, like what's going on here? And she's the granddaughter of somebody else. And it's like, well, it, either it reaches either. And then it, what happens if we play a game of telephone? And then Steve says, oh yeah, you can trust Suzette. Well, now we have a circle, kind of a triangle, you know, a bit of a love triangle, but you have a circle here where it's like, well, just because everybody in the circle tells you, you can trust everybody in the circle. That's rather circular. Oddly enough, a circle is, as Hegel says, an infinite regress right in front of your face. And the whole thing is right in front of your face, which is cool. Actually, Hegel, again, like Nicholas of Cusa thought that meant you have an immortal soul that you can actually see that. Piaget knew that four and five year old children somehow know a circle goes on forever and children before that don't. What gives? How often, how often does what have to happen before that happens? Don't know. But oddly enough, human beings are always, aren't they right now in politics in a circumstance where they have to trust people a la infinite regress. Well, the science of the, well, the scientific data says, and then that's backed up by them and then that's backed up by them. But it's also circular in that the scientific data is circulating amongst many different experts. So even in the hardest of sciences, you would have the dual problem of the circle and the line in any community, no matter any form of knowledge, because you have to have the problem of it circles around enough, but also it recedes enough to a base, but it doesn't fully recede, nor can it fully circle around. And those are opposite, but complementary motions of truth and meaning and forms of life and society, forms of knowledge, forms of practice, all of that. Again, forms of continuously beeping and unloading stuff outside from 7 a.m. onward. And then I try to give talks in the evening and then they decide to unload things that night. It is quite amusing for everyone. But again, that will end because the top floor is being built, so they'll start building other buildings nearby. The circle and the infinite regress. So Sextus ends the first book of his outline, which is the most famous and central condensed work of Sextus, by distinguishing skepticism from several other similar philosophies. First and foremost, that of Heraclitus, who does make dogmatic assertions. I got even soundproof curtains, I swear, and they are installed. You can see them back there. That one's open. Yeah. So, Sextus uh, says there are similar philosophers. Heraclitus, who does make dogmatic assertions, all is fire. Sextus says even Anastodemus and his followers believe skepticism is a path to Heraclitianism, seeing everything is made of relative oppositions. But Sextus believes that Anastodemus was wrong because Heraclitus is not entirely skeptical. So he likes Heraclitus, but not fully, some and some. Advancing dogmas of his own against the Heraclitians, perhaps was a text now lost. Sextus argues the same of Democritus, who asserted the truth of atomism, as I mentioned, I am informed by my own material, believe it or not. I mentioned with Democritus, well, he's skeptical, but not entirely. Well, Sextus says that to us in ancient times, not in the time of Democritus or Heraclitus, in Roman times afterwards, but he says what I told you, and I'm sticking with his version of it because it's a decent description of what's going on, a la Hegelese and dogmatism and skepticism, which Hegel gets from these skeptics right here. So it is often the case, uh, I have to say myself, I definitely notice uh, if for thinkers who are more dogmatic and believe in objective truth, they often accuse each other, as Sextus says, of being, uh, of being so dogmatic that no other dogmatist uh, is good. Think about, say, the fundamentalist. Can't trust any Buddhist or Islamic fundamentalist if they're a Christian fundamentalist because fundamentalists are black and white opposite side, right? But Sexist does say dogmatists 
fear the skeptic more than they fear any other dogmatist or fundamentalist. Why? Because the skeptic with some and some threatens all fundamentalism and all dogmatism. So if you're like, yeah, some of Christianity, some of Islam, all fundamentalists on all sides would hate and fear you, even though they hate and fear each other, which Sextus thinks uh, before he saw Christianity and Islam at war or anything like that, and never did, is he thinks, yeah, you can see that actually when human beings are more insistent and dogmatic and black and white, they hate each other, so dogmatism doesn't work. But you can also see they hate the skeptic because they are truly challenged by the skeptic who says, eh, some and some, sort of. That is more challenging to everyone. The dogmatist, the skeptic. And I will and I will end on the point that oftentimes dogmatists accuse each other of being too dogmatic and close-minded. And oftentimes skeptics accuse each other of nihilism, of not being enough, of not putting forward enough of a position. And that is ironic, but all too human. Yes? And of course it would be very much like that. And does that end? It continues. Because it's here today, and it was in ancient times in India, Greece, and also China. So much love and much love to the construction outside and all the beeping. I am going to continue to give talks this morning because I got to, in spite of the beeping and the infinite regress of insanity and humanity, some and some all together. So much love to you and yours through this pandemic and the circling and the lining and the underlining of everything. And I will see you if I ever see you.